Okay, everyone. So, Unit 4, AP Chem. It's your reminder. Go get your reference table. Okay, I got mine right next to me. Right here. Okay. So, Unit 4 is all about chemical reactions. So, before we go there, we're going to have to start with differentiating between what is a physical change and what is a chemical change. If it's a chemical change, then the molecular formula of the compound changes somehow. If the molecular formula of the compound does not change, it's a physical change. So I, I'm sure you've all like been learning this since fourth grade. We know what evaporation is, we know what condensation is, we know what melting means. I think we, should, we all know those are physical changes. Changes that occur when you go from different states of matter, from solid to liquid to gas, okay? Physical changes can involve you physically breaking something. Like if I have a textbook and I snap the thing over my knee and I break it into two pieces, that's a physical change, okay? So the more chemistry definition, the definition that you're expected to know on this is in a physical change, IMFs, intermolecular forces, thing we covered last video, IMFs are broken or formed. Take liquid water, for example, okay? The molecules of water, like I said in the previous video, are strong dipoles, they have H-bonding with each other, and, though, and so they exhibit strong intermolecular attractive forces between one another in the liquid state, and that's what makes them a liquid. Once we put in energy, remember it takes energy to break bonds, any type of bond, once we put in energy and we break those IMFs, we break the intermolecular attractions, that's how something becomes a gas. If there are no more intermolecular attractions, then there's nothing holding you in the liquid state. The particles distance themselves from each other and they become a gas. Okay? The same principle also applies when you go from a uh, when you go backwards, like let's say we go from gas to liquid, removing heat, removing heat from a gas will cause, again, the particles to slow down like we saw when we covered ideal gas law. Removing heat from a gas will cause the particles to slow down and as they slow down they start to form IMFs. They start to form dipole-dipole or H-bonding or whatever LDF might be occurring. So, when you remove heat, they go backwards. The gases turn to liquids, liquids turn to solids. In the action of removing heat, you are forming IMFs, okay? So, IMFs dictate physical properties. That's what we're trying to get across here. You will often see questions dealing with things like boiling point or melting point. Boiling point is at what temperature does a liquid turn into a gas? The melting point is the melt is the temperature at which liquid transition to gas or gas transitions to liquid. So uh, water, H2O, H2O liquid boils at 100, 100 degrees C, boils to H2O gas. And at 100 degrees C, H2O gas condenses to H2O liquid, okay? At 100 degrees C, pr what's pretty much happening is there's some going one way, some going the other way. As you increase the temperature past 100 degrees C, more becomes gas and less gas becomes liquid. So we're going to cover that uh, type of a reaction much later. It's called an equilibrium. 100 degrees C, when you compare it to many other molecules, is a very high boiling point. And you would be asked to explain, why does it have such a high boiling point? Because it has such strong IMFs. Something with weaker IMFs would have a much lower boiling point. Something with weaker IMFs would be much easier to turn into a gas. Okay? There's also things like melting point, which abide by the same rules. A higher melting point means that the uh, intermolecular attractions in the solid are much stronger. All right, so that brings us pretty uh, nicely into our other type of reaction, 
which is a chemical change. Chemical change. Um, in the laboratory, a chemical change can often be identified by uh, the release of heat, the release of light, the release of a smell, um, the form of a precipitate. We're going to cover what that is in just a moment. A change in color. So as I alluded to before, in a chemical reaction, chemical bonds are being broken. The actual bonds between atoms themselves are being broken and other bonds are being formed. Okay? So, uh, what's a good example? We can use uh, combustion. We take ethane, which is like this, and it reacts with some amount of O2 to produce some amount of CO2 and some amount of H2O. Okay? Pause this video right now and balance this equation for me. This is going to be something that you need to get down to second nature if you want to do well in this class. If you forget what balancing is, uh, we covered that in Unit 1, where I did a combustion analysis example, and I balanced the equation for you. Okay, I'm assuming you're back now. Okay, so as you can see here, on the left side of the equation, there's only CH bonds and CC bonds. And on this side of the equation, bonds, chemical bonds are being broken and they're being reformed. Now on this side we have CO bonds, and instead of CH we have OH bonds. So bonds were clearly broken and reformed into something else. Okay? And from the rule I gave you at the very beginning of the video, the chemical formulas of the species and the reaction have changed. So obviously it's a chemical reaction. So this right here, what I drew for you, is called a chemical equation, all right? Chemical equations can come in many forms, and because they exhibit different types of chemical reactions. You can write a chemical, uh, you can write a chemical equation for a physical transformation, okay? That, just because it's a chemical equation doesn't mean it's a chemical reaction. We uh, are going to start looking at what's called precipitation reactions first. There are three types of reactions that are going to make up the bulk of AP chemistry. Uh, precipitation, acid base, and redox. And we're going to get into exactly what all of these are in just a moment. In the precipitation reaction, precipitation reactions happen in solution. Okay? So... In solution, oh, we have ionic bonds dissociating into ions. So let me give you an example. Let's say I've got KCl, H, M, N, O, 4. Okay? So when we put this in solution, this is going to dissociate. These two species are going to dissociate into a K plus, plus a Cl minus, plus an H plus, plus an MnO4 minus. And now we can see what all the ions in our solution are. So I'm going to rewrite this side of the equation. On the left side of the chemical equation, if K plus Cl minus plus H minus plus MnO4 minus, okay? And those are going to react to form H plus and Cl minus and KMnO4. This is what we call a complete ionic equation. Now, some of you watching this right now are probably asking yourselves, how did I know that these are the products of the equation? Because on the AP Chem exam, they're going to give you two species, they're going to give you two species, they're going to dissociate into ions, and they're going to ask you what are the products, okay? Here's how I reason my way through this. Okay, I've got a K plus and a Cl minus, I've got an H plus and an MnO4 minus, okay? So these were my original two starting compounds, okay? They, they each compose an anion and a cation. A cation is something positively charged, an anion is something negatively charged, okay? A positive and a negative ion unite to form this compound, okay? So 
When they dissociate, they can either reunite to form KCl and HMnO4, and then no reaction happens because nothing changed. Or when they dissociate, they can switch partners. The H plus can unite with the Cl minus, and the K plus can unite with the MnO4 minus. All right? So they either uh, reunite with themselves and no reaction happens, or they switch partners and unite with the partner ion, and then a reaction happens. Okay? So because they're telling you that a reaction is happening, you have to know that the, you have uh, ions switching partners. Okay? There's only one way they can switch partners. I can't have Cl MnO4 because Cl is an anion and MnO4 is an anion, and I can't have two minus charges. I need to have a plus united with a minus. Okay? So that's how you figure out what the product in these uh, ionic equations is. And this KMnO4 uh, in solution is uh, what we call a precipitate. A precipitate is something that... I'm trying to find a better word. In chemistry we call it, it precipitates out of the solution. And what, if, what that's saying is, when the reaction is taking place, KMnO4, instead of being dissolved in the solution like the ions are, forms a solid, okay? And the solid collects at the bottom of the container. That's what a precipitate is. So a precipitation reaction is an, a reaction that involves ions in solution that when they react, they form a precipitate. They form a solid that collects out of the solution and they form a solid that does not dissolve in the solution that uh, collects on the bottom of the reaction vessel. Okay? So this is our a little throwback to our aqueous state of matter. You know, we had liquid, gas, we had solid, now this is aqueous. Aqueous is what you put next to ions. Okay? All ions are in the aqueous state of matter because they can only exist in an aqueous solution. Aqueous meaning water. Okay? So, you've got aqueous K+, plus, aqueous Cl-, minus, aqueous H+, plus, and aqueous MnO4- minus to form these two aqueous ions and this as a solid, right? Because it's a solid, it is not dissolved in the solution, okay? However, when we evaporate all the water, when we uh, remove all of the solution, this H plus and this Cl minus will come back together to form HCl, okay? And because there's no more water, this is a solid. So like I was saying before, this is a complete ionic equation. It shows all of the ions that were present in the reaction. Now, if you look at it, you see there's a Cl- minus on this side, a Cl- minus on that side, an H+, plus on this side, H+, plus on that side. Okay? So, we can rewrite this equation as something called a net ionic equation. Okay? A net ionic equation removes all of the so-called spectator ions. Spectator ions are ions that are present on both sides of the reaction. So when we remove the spectator ions, we remove the H+, plus, we remove the Cl-, minus, and we're left with the net ionic equation of K+, plus, plus MnO4-, minus, it gives us, that's not an equal sign, that's supposed to be an arrow, potassium permanganate. We're going to start on um, this skill that you need to master. It's called stoichiometry. So stoichiometry is, put in a nutshell, uh, the skill of being able to relate quantities on one side of a reaction to quantities on the other side of a reaction. Okay? So a very simple type of stoichiometric problem is I inserted 12 grams of 
KCl into the reaction vessel, how many grams of KMnO4 am I going to get out? Okay? So, in a problem like that, again, you're given 12 grams of KCl, that's your given, that's given to you in the problem, and in every uh, type of problem where you need to look at a reaction, you need to convert to moles, okay? So we convert 12 grams of KCl to however many moles of KCl, how many, however many particles of KCl, and since now I'm dealing with particles, I can now reference the equation. I can reference one particle of KCl produces one particle of KMnO4, okay? So if I have, let's say, for example, half of a mole of KCl, when the reaction's done, I'm going to have half of a mole of KMnO4. If I had this many particles starting out, and, the reaction, and when the reaction's done, I'm going to have that many moles of products. Okay? That's what we call our mole ratio. We saw it in ideal gas law. We're going to see it again here. What is the ratio of reactants to products, okay? What I see in the reaction, one KCl makes one KMnO4, so the mole ratio is one to one. Half a mole of KCl makes half a mole of KMnO4. So now that I have that, I'm gonna say, okay, when the reaction's done, I've got half a mole of KMnO4. Let me calculate the molar mass of KMnO4 and convert that to grams, all right? And that's how you would answer the question. If I'm given this many grams of this, how many grams does, this, does that produce? Common mistake is saying, okay, there's a one-to-one -one ratio. If I'm given 12 grams of this, I'm supposed to get 12 grams of that. False, not true. Grams are a measure of mass, okay? So um, stoichiometry is something I'm going to have to give to you guys on your own. Go to Khan Academy and start practicing as much as you can because stoichiometry is one of those uh, types of problems that can be asked so many different ways and it's a skill that's going to be applied in pretty much six out of the seven FRQs. So it's less a topic and more a skill that you need to master. So tonight I'd say just go to Khan Academy and do 20 stoic problems and do not stop until you can do 20 straight perfectly. You got any questions, you know, I got my Discord server linked down below. Ask me anything. I don't charge obviously. I'm here to I'm here to offer you guys answers. Anyway, let's keep going. Acid base reaction. All right? So, let's define what an acid is and what a base is. All right? There are two definitions of acid base. You've got the bronsted lowry definition and you've got the Lewis definition. We do not care about the Lewis definition for AP chemistry. The Lewis definition is only applied in organic chemistry. If we're not taking that class, forget the Lewis definition exists. Okay? We're going to focus on the bronsted lowry definition. You don't need to know that name, you don't need to know how to spell it, just some context. So the bronsted lowry definition is such that an acid is defined as a proton donor and the base is defined as a proton stealer. You know, like fluorine steals electrons from sodium, a base will steal protons. Okay, so let me give you some examples. Like I showed you here, HCl I erased it. HCl is an example of an acid, okay? Because when it dissociates in solution, it produces an H plus and a Cl minus, okay? Hydrogen has one electron, okay? The H plus ion, because it has a plus charge, means it has lost an electron. If hydrogen has only one electron, and it's lost its only electron, that means that the hydrogen plus ion is nothing but a proton floating free in space. All right. Floating free in solution. Like I said before, ions can only ever exist in solution. 
Okay, so by that definition, when H plus is present in solution, it is a proton. So by dissociating, H plus is free to be donated to some other species. Another example is HBr, HF, HI, the hydrogen bonded to a halogen. These are all acids. They all have differing or varying strengths, but we'll cover that topic much more in depth when we deal with equilibrium and the whole dedicated acid base unit. I think that's unit eight. Okay. So um, other types of acids that you may need to recognize um, is the hydrogen bonded to any of the polyatomic ions that you memorized in the beginning of the course. So hydrogen bonded to ClO4, perchloric acid. Hydrogen bonded to uh, NO3 or NO2? Well, there's NO2 and HNO3, okay? So you can have nitric acid, I think it's nitrous acid. Hydrogen bonded in an ionic bond is an acid. Just starting out, I'm going to tell you that these two and this one are strong acids. What I mean when I say strong acids is that if I put them in solution, they will completely dissociate. A weak acid is something that you put it in solution and some of it dissociates while some of it doesn't. Again, we'll cover that later. A base, for one, is any ionic compound that features an OH, most common of them being stuff like NaOH or KOH, such that in solution they dissociate into Na plus and OH minus, and K plus and OH minus. So any ionic compound that features an OH is automatically a base. Um, another type of weak base is NH3, NH, yes, NH3, okay. That, um, like I said before, the definition of a base is a proton stealer. If that, that has the ability to steal a proton and become NH4+. Plus. So guys, why don't you tell me this? If I have an OH- and it steals a proton, it steals an H+, plus, what does that become? H2O, correct. OH- minus stealing a proton becomes H2O, and OH- minus really likes to steal protons. OH- minus is a very strong base, okay? NH3, the reason that that's a base, and the reason that most of the things like it are a base, you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment, is because of its structure. In the uh, NH3, it's a tetrahedral with the base bonded to three hydrogen atoms and a lone pair up there. Any lone pair can interact with an H plus to form a bond. That also means that in H2O, it is structured like this. Lone pair, lone pair. Lone pair can interact with an H plus to form H3O plus. And this forms NH4 plus. Okay? Exposed lone pairs make any species able to act as a base. Again, exposed lone pairs are a much weaker type of base than something like OH minus, something with a minus charge. Okay, so let me give you an example of an acid-base reaction. I can have HCl plus NH3 and first step here is to break this up into our net ionic equation, excuse me, complete ionic equation. So this then comes over here to become H plus plus Cl minus plus NH3. And now we can look at what we've got here, okay? We've got an H plus and we've got a base. So this can become Cl minus plus NH4 plus. 
and that's an acid-base reaction. This is an example of an acid-base reaction. Now let's label our components here because there's one key uh, topic that you need to understand with acid-base reactions. They, first of all, on the reactant side, an acid, HCl, and a base is present. And on the product side, a conjugate acid and a conjugate base are present. Okay? So, for ease of interpretation, I'm going to replace this back with HCl. Okay. HCl, like I said above, is our acid. And H3, like I said before, is our base. Okay? When HCl loses a proton, it becomes Cl minus. And because it has a minus charge, it, ha it now has the ability to steal a proton. It's sort of like stealing back a proton to become HCl again. Okay? So, now that it has a minus charge, now it has the ability to steal back its proton, we call that a conjugate base. And this acid and this conjugate base are what we call a conjugate acid-base pair, okay? And the same context applies here. NH4, NH4 plus, has the ability to lose a proton, to donate a proton, and become NH3 again. So we would call this the conjugate acid of NH3. And this is yet another conjugate acid-base pair. An acid-base reaction is defined as a reaction that exhibits two acid-base pairs, right? One acid-base pair, two acid-base pairs. Okay, that also means that acid-base reactions are reversible. If I put this in reverse, Cl minus plus NH4 plus, uh, that could become HCl plus NH3. And in this case, this is our base, this is our acid, and this is our conjugate acid, this is our conjugate base. Not all of what, um, I'm not going into depth into a lot of things, right? Again, I'm just skimming the surface of acid-base reactions. We're gonna cover them super in-depth, unit eight. Okay, that's, um, okay, the main feature of the acid-base reaction is something called a titration. Now, I don't like titrations because you need to memorize a lot of weird vocabulary to understand them, okay? And it, they're very... They're best understood in the context of a in the context of a picture. Okay, and they'll often on the AP exam when you're presented with a titration, you'll be presented with a picture, and you'll need to be able to recognize it. Okay. So in a titration, the general setup is like this. This is your table. This is a metal rod sticking up. Metal rod is attached to something that looks like a really big syringe with a sh uh, sharp end right there. It's secured to that metal rod, okay? And at the bottom of that really big syringe is a flask. This really big syringe is called your burette. This is a flask. It could be referred to as the name of a flask, like an Erlenmeyer flask, graduated cylinder, perhaps. You just need to know the names of different lab equipment, different glassware. This could be any bottle, right? It could be an Erlenmeyer flask, it could be a graduated cylinder, anything. So, in your Erlenmeyer flask, I'm going to call it an Erlenmeyer flask because that's what this is. That's what you call the thing with the triangular base. In the Erlenmeyer flask is the species that is referred to as your analyte. Analyte. 
Think of it like you're analyzing the analyte. And in the burette, the species in the burette is called your titrant. Okay, and at the bottom of the burette, you know, you've got this little nozzle with a valve on it, so you can control how much uh, of the species pours out of the burette and into the Erlenmeyer flask. And that valve is called a stopcock. I don't know how to spell it, and I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> so, stopcock, you control it to see how much of the titrant escapes the burette into the analyte. And this is an acid-base reaction because uh, very often how this is set up is you have some species in your flask. Either the acid's going to be in the burette or the base is going to be in the Erlenmeyer flask or the other way around. For this example, I'm going to say the base is in the Erlenmeyer flask. So the base is your analyte. And very often on the AP exam, they do it that way. They you put the base in the analyte. And they say, we don't know what the concentration of the base is. So remember from last video when we covered concentration, concentration is in units of molarity, and that's calculated by moles of solute over liters of solution. So the way a titration is performed is we're trying to find the concentration of the base. All right. So we know how much liquid is in the Erlenmeyer flask. The Erlenmeyer flask has little dashes so we can measure how much liquid is in there. Okay. So we know how many liters our solution is. We know that. That is known. We're trying to figure out how many moles of base we have dissolved in the solution. Okay, so the way we do that is we put an acid in the burette. The acid is going to be our titrant. Okay, let's just say, for example, that the base is NaOH and the acid is HCl. The acid is of known concentration. The acid is of known concentration, so the molarity of this is known. We know it. Let's say it's one molar, one mole of HCl per liter of solution in our titrant. Okay? And the burette has little dashes, as you see, to measure how much liquid has escaped and how much liquid you started with. And as you open the stopcock, the acid will escape very slowly into the Erlenmeyer flask of NaOH. And this reaction happens, HCl plus NaOH, we're going to write out our net ionic equation, Cl minus plus Na plus plus OH minus, and that's going to become, again, if the ions reunite with their partners, no reaction happens. So, because we know a reaction is happening, they have to be switching partners. It becomes OH minus plus H plus comes H2O, Cl minus, Na plus, NaCl. Okay? So, we continue to add HCl into our NaOH until the reaction stops. Okay? And we're going to have an indicator in the solution to let us know when the reaction stops. The reactions, when the reaction stops, we call that the equivalence point. It's very important. We call that the equivalence point. The reaction stops at the equivalence point because in that moment, you have added an equal number of moles of acid as to the number of moles of base that were present. So let me rephrase that. There were a certain number of moles of NaOH that were present in that entire flask, okay? The equivalence point is when all of that NaOH is done reacting. Therefore, there are no more moles of NaOH, and all of the NaOH has been converted to NaCl and H2O, okay? That means that in order to do that, 
Since this is a 1 to 1 mole ratio, each NaOH reacts with 1 mole of HCl. You had to add the same amount of HCl into that flask as were moles of NaOH. So if you had one mole of NaOH, you needed to add one mole of HCl into that flask in order to reach the equivalence point, okay? And since you've got little tick marks on your burette, you can calculate exactly what mass, what volume of HCl you added, okay? Let's say we added 50 milliliters of HCl, and that got us to the equivalence point. If we did added 50 milliliters of HCl, and that was a one molar concentration of HCl, that means we have 50 millimoles of HCl that were added, or 0 0.05 moles. So that's some, just a little bit of conversion. 50 milliliters times one molar. Again, molar is in the units of moles per liter. So 50 milliliters times one mole per liter gives us 50 millimoles. And that's just, you move the decimal place to convert to normal moles, 0 0.05 moles. Since, since now we know how much HCl we added, we know that the same amount of NaOH must have been present in here. So now we know that 0 0.05 moles of HCl reacted with precisely 0 0.05 moles of NaOH. And since we now know how many moles of NaOH we had, we can use that in our molarity equation. Because remember, at the beginning of the experiment, we recorded what was the volume in the Erlenmeyer flask, how many liters of solution we had. So we take 0 0.05 divided by our original measurement of volume, and we get the molarity. The reason I say the original measurement of volume is because we have added some amount of liquid to this, so that now the volume is greater than when we began. Okay, and the point of a titration, the goal of a titration is, like I said, Find out the concentration of the base. This is how you do it. Okay. <sighs> Moving on. This is the last type of reaction, the redox reaction. Okay, so here's our redox reaction. In chemistry, every single atom in a molecule, every atom in a compound, can be assigned what's called an oxidation number. Okay? Now, an oxidation number can be assigned based off of the following set of rules. You're going to have to memorize these rules. I'm sorry. This is why I didn't like it, because I don't like memorizing. But you got to do what you got to do, you know? Anyway, the rules are as follows. Any compound, um, any compound that contains exclusively one type of atom, so for example, O2, O2 is just O double bond O, any compound that contains only one type of atom has both atoms have an oxidation number of zero. It's rule number one. Rule number two, any ion has the same oxidation number as its charge. So the Cl minus ion has an oxidation number of one. The, N, uh, the Mg2 plus ion has an oxidation number of two. Okay? Oxygen when it's in a situation where it is not an ion, it's not in a homogeneous compound, oxygen always has an oxidation number of two minus. And the Cl would have been one minus, excuse me. Hydrogen generally always has an oxidation number of one plus, okay? All of the oxidation numbers in any compound must add to zero, okay? All of the oxidation numbers must add to zero. So H2O, for example. O is two minus, H is plus one, H is plus one. All the oxidation numbers sum to zero, okay? So based off of that principle, how about you tell me the redox, the oxidation numbers on the three atoms in CO2? Oxygen minus two, oxygen minus two, C plus four. They must always sum to zero. 
here, both of the both of the oxygens have a oxidation number of zero that sums to zero. So let's take a look at the uh, ethane. So hydrogen plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. So we've got six plus ones from six hydrogens. All right. So we have two carbons. These two carbons are identical. What I mean, what do I mean by identical? One carbon is bonded to three hydrogens and another carbon. The other carbon is bonded to three hydrogens and another carbon. So they're identical, meaning they have to have the same oxidation number. If we, if the total atom has a plus six charge right now, then we need to have a minus six charge to balance that out. Okay, the minus six charge, because these two atoms are identical, will be evenly divided between them. One's a minus three, the other's a minus three. So that because they're identical uh, carbons, they will have the same oxidation number. One minus three, the other minus three. Okay. So this is a redox reaction because oxidation numbers are changing. Okay. If you look at a precipitation reaction, oxidation numbers never change. Okay. MnO4 has a minus charge. K plus has a plus charge. Okay. In, in this, the K would have a plus one oxidation number and this whole species would have a minus one oxidation number. Okay. O4, if you wanted to get more specific into the individual atoms themselves, O4, four oxygen atoms, would have a minus eight. And since this whole species needs to add to minus one, then minus eight, Mn would have to have an oxidation number of plus seven. So on the AP exam, you're going to be asked to A, assign oxidation numbers to all of the atoms in a reaction, and B, define which atoms are being reduced and which atoms are being oxidized. So let's talk about what that means. Remember the uh, acronym Leo the Lion says Grr. I stole that from AP Daily. Leo the Lion says Grr. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Oxidation. Gaining electrons, electrons, is reduction, reduction, okay? Leo the lion says grr. Loss of electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction, okay? So gaining electrons means you have a more minus charge, losing electrons means you have a more positive charge. Okay, so on the reactant side, this O2, oxygen had a zero oxidation number in that. Now we go to the products in CO2, oxygen has a minus two charge. So minus two means it gained electrons. So therefore it was reduced. So oxygen was reduced to a two minus oxidation state. Let's look at the hydrogen. Hydrogen was a plus one on this side, and it was a plus one on that side. So hydrogen was neither reduced nor oxidized. Carbon was a minus three on this side, and carbon was a plus four on this side. Therefore, it lost electrons. It was oxidized, okay? In the one of the defining features of a redox reaction uh, is the coupling of an oxidation and a reduction. O participated in a reduction reaction, carbon participated in an oxidation reaction. That's why it's called a redox reaction. One species is being reduced, the other species is being oxidized. There's there are always a couple <clears throat> they're always a coupled reaction. Okay, that's unit four. Enjoy life guys.